How much of the campaign do you need to have completed before you can get into a vessel of hatred? Uh, none. <laughs> <laughs> I think the beautiful thing about Vessel of Hatred is you can jump right into it. If you haven't had the opportunity to play the base game, of you, of course, can come in and play the base game and then go into the story that we're presenting in Vessel of Hatred. But if you want to get straight into the action of uh, Vessel of Hatred and start uh, campaigning through the new region of Hantu, um, you can actually skip the base campaign. Um, and we do have a little uh, video that kind of goes over all of the campaign and summarizes everything that happened in Sanctuary with Lilith and the character characters in the base game so that you understand where Nayrel and Mephisto are positioned um, as you, the hero, are following them into Nahantu. So um, it's really, it's, it's prepared for whatever the player experience is jumping in. Yeah, and it, it, what's one of the nice things about the Spiritborn as a new class is that you can actually play the original campaign as the Spiritborn. So you can actually go back and experience that whole story from that perspective, and then you can carry that into the expansion as well. So we've really made, tried to make it clear that Whatever the player journey is into the expansion, they're able to go in and have a seamless experience. So you can come in as a level one first time playing and go right in because we want you to be able to play with your friends. Or you could be an Eternal Realm player who's all the way to level 100. You can be a seasonal player that's halfway through and like it's entirely up to you how you want to begin your how that road. But I love the previously on video, like previously on Diablo 4, and that kind of catches you up so that you didn't miss anything. But you know, like gameplay is driven a lot by what your friends are playing and you wouldn't want to be, oh, to your friends, you know, I've played it and now are playing the expansion, they want you to join in. You're like, oh, do I have to go play this for 40 hours before I go do this? They're like, no, come on, you know, jump right into the expansion. So it's fun. What is the process of choosing whether or not to the previous season mechanics are added to the to the core game? What are your people that are taking on? Well, it's player feedback, really. It's you know, one of the things we try to do is We've been using the seasons as a, you know, one of the things we love about seasons is they're basically a reset, like they're a sandbox to do experiments and have sort of novel gameplay to come back for. And then we look at what's really, some things just are so resoundingly positive, we're like, oh, we better bring that forward. Like, you know, the, the ability for the necromancer to have the corpse explosions go off automatically and the corpse tendrils go off automatically, that was such a strong feature that we had to turn that into a ring so that you could get that and have that in the, as we go, you know, and so, the way I like to say is that when people talk about the success of things like season four and season five, is I say that you know those seasons don't exist without one, two, and three because we had to learn along the way and come. I think we have found kind of our rhythm now of how to listen to players in terms of way we get feedback, both qualitative and round tables and social media and, and just talking directly through surveys as well, or in the quantitative, which is like we've got all the data and the metrics, and so we just go and look at all this information and then we start communicating back. And now we're doing things like the public test realm, where we're actually giving people the, a chance to play it before it becomes part of the season. And that's been great for season four and season five. What are some of the biggest things that you've learned since release? Obviously the, the expansion again is, is, a, is a big sort of tentpole moment. What have you learned from the process so far that you're taking into the expansion and, and what we can expect to see going forward? One of our pillars is you know, play your own way. Um, and so, like we just talked about how in the campaign, regardless of what type of player you are and where you're at with your experiences with Diablo 4, you're gonna have an excellent experience. Um, and I think the beauty of a game like Diablo 4 is that it does support so many different play styles and so many different types of players. Um, and that's something that we've really been able to uh, enhance with Vessel of Hatred. I think that we had it in the base game as well. But I'm really excited that any, like, we have our very, very heavy campaign players, our Eternal Realm players. Obviously, Vessel of Hatred has a brand new campaign um, and a brand new region for them to explore with all different content that we've added to the game. Um, and then if you're really interested in coming up with unique builds, um, we obviously have a new Spiritborn class. Um, and then we're just enhancing how you can craft your playstyle with the mercenary system. Um, I'm really excited about that because it's building upon uh, a core feature that Diablo 2 had, Diablo 3 had. And we're just enhancing that even further in Diablo 4. Um, the four mercenaries that we're bringing to the table, each of them actually has their own skill tree. And so the player has the ability to kind of enhance this, the, the build that they have on their hero class um, and amplify kind of what you're looking for in your build. Um, our game director, Brian Gibson, likes to say, every class kind of has a soft spot. Your mercenary is an opportunity to round out your play style. Um, and I think that's really exciting because it's something that you can change on the fly. Each of those four mercenaries actually has a branch in their skill tree, so it's got two 
different skill trees you can kind of go down. Um, and then we also have a reinforcement system. So if I happen to be playing with Rod, we can't bring our mercenaries on our adventure with us, but um, unlike the previous games, you can actually add in what we call reinforcements now. And so I can choose one of their skills and tie it to one of the actions that I'm taking in gameplay. For example, I can tie it to my basic skill, um, or I can tie it to a moment where maybe I take a big hit and I'm at low health. And maybe I want to make my reinforcement uh, one of Rahir's skills. He's a mercenary with a big shield, and he comes in, he puts a little shield around us so I can jump out, drink a potion, and get back into the combat. And so I think it just being able to cater to so many different ways that people want to play is really, really what's amazing. Yeah, and I think that applies to the modes as well. Like one of the things we looked at is that play your own way or finding new ways to play. When you look at, you know, we're bringing two new dungeon types to the expansion as well. So we have the Dark Citadel, which is our new co-op PVE, uh, where it's more a multiplayer-based dungeon that requires more, like at least two people to be able to work your way through it. Uh, and then we have the Karas Undercity, which is this time attack dungeon, which is a, a really cool take on the sort of aggressive way of playing where you can put in a tribute to sort of set your difficulty and set your reward target that you're trying to go after. And then you have to go and kill certain things to keep time on the clock until you get to the boss. And so there's like those sorts of things where you see like in season five, the Infernal Horde, we added this sort of wave based you know, mechanic. We're always trying to find new and interesting ways to take that really fun Diablo combat and, and sort of play with that formula a little bit. What are the big points of feedback that the team is looking for to address once Vessel of Hatred is out? What are the sort of core things that you expect to see change based on your player feedback? You know, we're, we're always, we're very, very connected with our community. Um, the dialogue that we have with them is really, really important. And, uh, you know, we like to say it's no longer just the, the development team's game, it's the community's game. And so hearing about, like every time we put out a new season um, and we do make some changes to the game and we refresh that sandbox, we're always instantly, you know, looking for what the community has to say about it. Um, and that's why you know, we've been doing the player test realms um, and we've been working with the community so closely. Um, we have our own ideas. We have our own roadmap of things that we want to update down the line. Um, and the priorities shift and change depending on the feedback that we get from the community, so. I think it's going to be a lot of, about the balance. You know, like the PTR will be great. We're doing a PTR for season six. And so we'll be able to get a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about, and, you know, um, sort of tuned before it goes live. But when we, we're bringing a whole new class, and which means you can play, you know, it's going to really affect the landscape in terms of balance. And so the notion of like how the Spiritborn impacts the meta of our seasons, how the mercenaries impact the meta. So I think, this, you know, we always go in with a sort of sense of like, okay, we've done a lot of testing, a lot of playing, we feel good. But we know that as soon as we hand it to the players that they're going to find new and interesting ways to combine things and make really powerful builds that we need to look at and, and whether it's hopefully not breaking our servers but is actually just fun and overpowered as opposed to breaking and overpowered. But um, that's probably the biggest thing I think is we have a lot of new elements in season six and with the expansion coming in that fortunately the PTR will help us get a head start on that stuff and then once it goes live then we'll, we'll get even more feedback. A lot of players were excited when the Spirit Ball was announced, but a lot of players have also been hoping for some of the classic classes to come back as well. And Not like a Paladin or something? I've never paladin, heard that. Paladin. Have you heard that people I'm, want a Paladin? I'm unfamiliar with this feedback. <laughs> so what do you, what's the reception been like, you know, seeing a, a sort of split between the excitement of a new class, a desire for their old favorites, and, and what do you say to people that still might be, to, 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 to the pocket of people that want the classic ones, but also to the people that yeah. want fresh new ones along the life of Diablo as well. I think what you see in the main game is that we really tried to pay an homage to the past. You know, we wanted to make sure that, that all the classic ways of playing Diablo were there with the necromancer and the rogue and the sorcerer, and we wanted to make sure that we, you know, it had been so long between D3 and D4, we wanted to make sure that we had those classics. And But from a team perspective, and we really wanted to use this opportunity to add something fresh. And what was really important to us too is that we knew we were going to go to someplace different. You know, when you think about Diablo 4, you think about Gothic and medieval and those sorts of things. And we were like, well, we're going to go to we're going to go south and we're going to go into the jungles. And so we were like, well, we want to have a class that actually comes from the place we're going. So it wasn't like this abstract class was brought in that had no reason to be there, right? And so the idea of the Spiritborn allowed the team to kind of stretch their creative muscles and go into a place that we haven't gone before and it allowed us to provide a continuity to the expansion that like not only are you going to the jungles of Nahantu, but you're going to play a class from the jungles of Nahantu. And so I think it's just really cool. 
The Spiritborn itself has a very strong tie to the spirit realm, and that's why they have, um, if you haven't had a chance to play the demo yet, we have here, um, the, the Spiritborn has four rulers, the gorilla, the eagle, the centipede, and the jaguar. How could I forget? It's the one right behind me. Uh, and the one I think that's on. Uh, Rod was wearing a jaguar shirt yesterday. Um, and, and the campaign really, you know, as you're playing through the campaign, you will go between the spirit realm and the world of sanctuary. And so not only is the class itself coming from the region that you're exploring, it is tied deep, uh, you know, very, very closely to the campaign that you're going through as a hero. So that's doubly exciting. And we know that like, one of the great things about bringing a class is it takes the, even the existing content you had and changes it up. Like I said, you can play the Spirit Born through the main campaign. And you look at what we're doing with the Mortal, we already had the Blood Knight and the Tempest, so we brought two new classes. They have eight classes now. And so, and even D3, we brought the Necromancer class pack. And so the idea of we're bringing the Spirit Four and Diablo Four. So this is not going to be the only class we add to Diablo. So for those who are looking for something more classic, those we have opportunities for that. And on that note, the, the Previously, you've said the plan is for yearly expansions. I don't think I've ever said that officially. Did I ever say that officially? I. I <laughs> <laughs> well, is that the plan still the plan going forward? And will each expansion also bring a class with it? Or are you looking to introduce classes along the seasons as well? Yeah, I mean, there's. Our future roadmap, like where we have a, a pretty extensive, we know we're going to be supporting Diablo for years to come. And so we know this, we want to continue to do this. And, you know, our players deserve to have more content to play and more ways to play. So we're going to keep doing that. But in terms of what's the cadence, cadence and the right amount is not something I can talk about today. Diablo 4 has a lot of MMO elements, obviously, and that's been expanded upon with the hideouts and things like that. Yeah. The shared world events and the bosses, but the, the new endgame dungeon activities coming in Investor Hatred looks to continue the trend of requiring players to party up. That's not always been the requirement for Diablo. I just wanted to know what was the goal behind the new dungeon activity and how does it factor into the idea of Diablo 4 being a more social MMO-esque experience? I think like we were just talking about, because we have different developers working on different things, we can both be very reactive, then we also have the ability to kind of innovate and, and take the experience with Diablo 4 someplace that Diablo hasn't ever really explored before. And so I'm super excited about Dark Citadel because as a Diablo player, this is this is a brand new experience um, to have to cooperate with someone like Rod. Uh, to, be to, able, <laughs> to be able to get through those mechanics is really exciting to me because Previously, in my Diablo experiences, it, it, there just hasn't been a dungeon like this, um, and then and so I think being able to bring that to our players like a different uh, level of encounter that just requires me to think a little bit differently uh, within I think the bounds of the the, the me mechanics and combat that we all know and love in Diablo 4 is very exciting. Um, and, and as Rod mentioned, you know we are bringing that party finder. Um, feature so that it, it is easier if you happen to not have a lot of friends like me, sadly, <laughs> just kidding, um, to be able to find a party of others to, to get through uh, that challenge with. And then every week there's actually uh, new rewards, which will encourage you to go back every week to try and get like really, really cool cosmetics. Um, for me, that's a big social aspect of games like this, um, being able to like stand in town and show off. You're peacocking, hey, you're peacocking. Yeah, yeah. totally peacocking. Uh, with, whether it's like the titles that we have in D4 or whatever cosmetics, uh, that, that really pushes me, I think, to engage with new content. And there, always, there always has to be a, there always has to be a first time for everything. And so that's why I always find funny people are like, well, you haven't ever done this before. And like, yeah, that's kind of true with everything. Yet there's, at some time, it was the first time we did it. And so this idea that having this sort of open world where you can, you see people come together to take down a world boss, or you see people come down to, come together to take down a local event. That idea of coming together to complete a dungeon, we think is really exciting and could be interesting. So again, it's about, there are other ways to play. If that's not something we have, the Kiras Undercity, which is you can play solo and be very aggressive with, or the Infernal Hordes. Or, so we're not trying to be prescriptive, we're trying to give options and variety, and so this is just one of the, another different way to play.